Hey church, today we are in Hebrews chapter 12, so let's go ahead and turn there. These first couple of verses of Hebrews 12 probably actually belong at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, um, because it starts in verse 1, therefore. So we know that that what he's about to write refers back to what was written in chapter 11. You remember yesterday we read through chapter 11, oftentimes called the Hall of Fame chapter of the Bible, where it just goes through all these examples of patriarchs and heroes from the scriptures, and, and some named, some not named, and, um, and just kind of sets for us you know, kind of a, an, exa- uh, an idea of what, where we're coming from, what has, who has gone before us. And it's going to be really important to what he says here in these first couple of verses. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, all those people talked about in Hebrews 11. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so the analogy that's being, the, the picture that's being brought up here is of a race, and specifically it's of a relay race, right? So in a relay race, uh, you're on a team, and, and one person will run their, their lap, and then they hand off a baton to the next person who's going to run their leg of the race. Well, that's sort of what Christianity is a little bit like. We've had all these people who have gone before us and been faithful to God and, and faithfully run their race, and now they've handed off the baton to you and to me, and now it's our turn to run. And it says that this race is really important, that we need to run this race with endurance. So we know that, that it's actually difficult. Um, uh, the word race there is the word in, in Greek. It's agona or agon. It's the same where we get the word agony from. It's, um, it's really like... like paints this picture of a distance running. If you are familiar with distance running at all, <laughs> to me, it's like, like the worst possible thing is to go out and just run for the sake of running. Um, and, and when you see those distance runners, man, it's really agonizing. You can tell that people are pushing themselves to the point that they're in extreme pain. And so that's what's in view here. It's, it's comparing the Christian uh, life with a race and that we're supposed to run it with endurance. We have need of endurance. But it gives us these two things that cause us problems. It gives us encumbrances and sins, which it says to lay aside because they, they so easily entangle us. It's interesting to give us these two different categories, um, the first being encumbrance um, and the second being sin. Not everything that trips us up is sinful. There can also be things that are not sinful, but they're encumbrances. You know, I've talked to people over the years who say, man, I just have so much going on at work right now that I can't really be involved in a home group. I can't really be involved in church. I don't have time to read my Bible or those kinds of things. Now, working hard is good. Uh, work is good. It's, it's, it's important to be able to provide for your family and, and do hard work. But if it's, if it's becoming an encumbrance, not allowing you to run and do the things that God has called you to do, there's nothing that we shouldn't cast off to say, God, I want to keep you first and foremost in my, in my life. I want to focus myself on you. And then sin, we all know how sin so easily trips us up and entangles us and, and causes us such difficulty in, in running our races. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I remember several years ago, I was watching a, um, the Carlsbad, um, uh, I forget what, marathon. It was the Carlsbad Marathon. And there are these two Kenyan runners, and they were so far ahead of everybody else. In, in fact, the area that these runners came from um, is the area is right by the area where we do our, our ministry, KMTI, and our youth venture ministry really works out of our headquarters are in Kenya. And because the greatest distance runners in the world all come from this very small region of Kenya, and these guys were from there. And they were setting the race. They were the ones who were setting the pace, and they were so far ahead of everybody else. And here it says the importance in a race of having someone who you are looking to, the pace setter, the person who's out front. I said the person who's out front for us is Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So keep our eyes fixed on him. Run like you're running to him. Um, And it says that for consider him who's endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What he's pointing to here is the difficulty that this church, the Hebrew church that he's writing to, is going through. And he's saying, look at Jesus. Jesus is our example. He's the one we want to firmly fix our eyes on. And he also went through incredible, he endured incredible hostility um, from sinners against himself. And and as we set Jesus as our focus and our point and pursuing him, that uh, we won't lose heart, that we'll be able to run with endurance and finish the race. Now in verse 4 through verse 17, he's going to transition into this section on discipline. And he's going to talk about the discipline of the Lord and, and even the discipline that the Hebrew church is going through. They're, they're encountering all kinds of persecution and, and being rejected by the people around them, physical persecution, people are being put in prison. It's all kinds of very difficult things that they're encountering. 
And it says that part of what's going on is that God is disciplining them. God is strengthening them. God is making them stronger. And, and it'd be easy to get the, the, the point that maybe God's mad at us. Maybe God is angry with us. Maybe God is punishing us. But discipline is different than punish. In fact, discipline has to do with love. With, I'm a father of, of five, and one of the things I tell people is that one of my favorite things to do is spank my kids. And I do it, I say that because I want to see the shock on their face. And then I explain, there's nothing really um, uh, enjoyable about spanking my kids other than the fact that I know that by disciplining my kids, I'm helping them to grow. I'm helping them, I, I think about all the things in the future that they're not going to have to struggle with, that they're not going to have to deal with because of the discipline they receive from their father. Well, the Bible says here in, in verse 6, it says, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. If you want to be received by God, then you can expect discipline because God is going to, is going to lovingly um, discipline you to remove those things that are displeasing from Him. And then He says in verse 10, He says, But He disciplines us for our good so that we may share in His holiness. That's what He's after. He's after uh, our holiness to become like Him. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. How good is it to have that peace of knowing that you are in right standing with God, that you and God are on good terms? I'm telling you, I've been on bad terms with God before, and it makes me never want to go there again. I want to keep myself walking under His discipline. And so in that regard, um, when, when discipline comes in my life, it's painful. I don't like it. But I know that if, if, I, if I endure it, if I faithfully endure it, that God is going to bring about that peaceful fruit of righteousness. But if I run from it, if I try to hide from it, if I try to avoid it, I know that there's only pain down that direction. He goes on to say, uh, really in verse 15, something really important. He says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. I just, this struck out to me because I thought um, that's really how bitterness works. When bitterness springs up in our hearts, it ends up corrupting other people, it ends up defiling a lot of other people. People start to pick sides. People start to choose whose side they're on. And, and it, it not just affects you or the person maybe you have some uh, has sinned against you, but it affects all kinds of people. And we want to keep short accounts. We want to be gracious and quick to forgive and guard our hearts against any form of bitterness. No matter how poorly you're treated, no matter how bad you're rejected, guard your heart against bitterness. You do not want that kind of thing going on in your life. Well, down in verse 18, 18 through 24, he's going to go back to contrasting. Um, and this theme we've seen throughout the entire Bible of contrasting how Jesus is is greater than the high priest. He's, our high priest is greater than the, the Old Testament high priest. Our covenant is greater than the Old Covenant. He's going to talk. He talks about how Jesus is greater than angels. All these kinds of things. But here he's going to talk about how um, Mount Zion is better than Mount Mount Sinai. And so you need a little bit of Old Testament background for this. If you remember, Mount Sinai was the mountain in the wilderness where um, where Moses went up and received the Ten Commandments. And when when the 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 camp of Israel came to Mount Sinai. It was filled with smoke and thunder, and, and it was just very foreboding. It was very scary. And here it's saying that that represents, that, that Old Testament mountain represents the Old Testament law and, and where God gave the law to him. And it was, it was, um, it was very scary and very, um, uh, God stood afar off. And it says in verse 21, it says, And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of the fear and trembling. It was a terrifying thing to come to, to Mount Sinai. It was, a, it was a fearful thing to come to Mount Sinai. But then he can, he, he's going to shift and talk about Mount Zion. Now, if you remember, Mount Zion is actually the mount that the temple in Jerusalem is on. And um, it's the place where Jesus was, uh, was crucified on Mount Zion. He was, he was um, found guilty and his crucifixion happened there. He was actually buried on Mount Zion. He rose from the dead on Mount Zion. And then Mount Zion actually holds a place uh, in the new heavens and new earth. We'll see that in a second. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So saying Abel in the Old Testament, remember, um, he brought an offering to God. Of, of, uh, he was a shepherd. He brought a sheep uh, the, the, without blemish. God received it. It was a good offering. But the offering that Jesus has given us is so much better. And, and, and it talks about the, the heavenly Jerusalem. If you skip over to um, Revelation chapter 21, I'm just going to read verse 1 through 4. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now listen to this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. God himself will be with us, all the people. And it says in verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So all of those things that was going on in Mount Sinai in the Old Testament with Moses, fear, foreboding, scariness, all those things are very different on Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is a place of God's grace and peace and loving affirmation. And just to seal that idea up, he, he goes on in verse 25 um, through 28. He talks about the, the kingdom that cannot be shaken. And he says this in verse 27. It says, This expression, expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. So this idea that, that, um, that God allows shaking to happen. This is a word for today because we had a lot of shaking going on in our culture, a lot of shaking going on in our society. It says that God is allowing that shaking to happen so that those things that are unshakable, His unshakable kingdom can be revealed. Man, I am so grateful and thankful to God that we are part of his unshakable kingdom, that the things that he has established, those things that, that he says are going to come and those things that he says are, that he ordains are going to come to pass, they are 100% going to happen. That we can put all of our trust in him and everything that we trust in God cannot be shaken by anything here on this earth. God bless you, church. We'll see you tomorrow.